yourself and, and questioning yourself in dialogue with someone you respect is both pleasant and sometimes extremely insightful and useful sometimes. Oh yeah. Tasty Nation, good morning. Yeah, it is March 26, a little bit after 5 o'clock p.m. Central Time, the best time. You know what that means. It's time for the all-new evening show at Tasty Live, The Price of Truth, the podcast where we explore the incentives that govern our world, the idea to have great minds come on and share great ideas today, my friends, is no different. We have, we don't have enough time for chit-chat here. Let's get right to it. We have the great... Stephanie Link of Hightower Advisors. Stephanie, we are so thrilled to have you with us at our little podcast here. Thanks for joining us. How are you doing? Thanks so much, Victor. It's great to be here. It's great to have you. I want to actually, there's so many things that I, I'd like to, to explore with you. But before we get into it, I wonder if you could just give us, like, what is your style? How would you describe your style? There's macro analysts, there's top down, there's bottom up, stock pickers, technical analysts, you know, vol vol people. What what? How would you describe your style, Stephanie? So I'm a combination, but it's a fundamental angle. So the combination is a little bit of top down in terms of strategy and and looking at business cycles, looking at the Fed, looking at inflation, looking around the world. Uh, and that I spend about thirty to forty percent of my time mm. uh, because that is actually where. I formulate where I want to have exposure in terms of globally and what sectors I want to be overweight or underweight or, or neutral relative to my benchmark. Um, and then I do the rest is t uh, bottoms up, fundamental analysis, deep dives on companies. Uh, I'm a big long term a uh, theme person. So while I get mark to market, as we all do every day as a portfolio manager in equities, that's important. I am very benchmark aware, but and very performance driven. But I also think if you can get the long term themes right, mm -hmm. then ultimately you can make a lot of money. And so that's how I s sort of start the process. And then I will say, um, and I would say the 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 the, um, the theme is really large cap core, which is a little bit of growth and value. Mm. And I can tilt if I want to be 100 percent growth. I can if I think that's the right style. If I want to be 100% value, I can do that too. But usually I do kind of like a 60-40 mix of value versus growth. Mm. Um, the S&P 500, as you know, is 75% growth. Sure. So I better get the style right for me to outperform. Uh, but I am really focused on underlying fundamentals of companies. And I'm a big, big fan. This, this comes from my Jim Cramer days big fan of company management teams, the CEOs, the bench, the, their bench, and and the importance of have they executed well, uh, what is their strategy, and, and that sort of thing, and, and, and really the track record. And so in my portfolio, I have about 30 names, and I will not put a stock into my portfolio unless I have met the CEO and the bench. Mm. And doing this just as long as you, um, with a, I have a lot of gray hair, you don't, but j doing this for a long period of time, you get to meet CEOs over the years and you get to know their personalities. And I, they don't tell me anything that's not, you know, that's not public. I don't want to know that. But you do get a sense of their body language. You get a sense of where what their time frames are on certain projects and strategies and that sort of thing. And mm. so um, I, I very much enjoy getting to know the companies from a deep down level. Don't get the wrong impression. That's shoe polish, Stephanie. Um, <laughs> let me, it's a good shoe polish. <laughs> all right, let me ask you this then. How has the landscape over the last couple of years changed um, how you pick individual investments? And we're going to go into individual names and sectors here in a little bit. I want to find out what you think is cheap, what you think is expensive across the market, cyclicals, AI, everywhere. But before we get there, I just want to know how has positive real rates, how has geopolitical, you know, geopolitical tensions around the world? In other words, 
What are you doing differently today than you might have been doing in 2019? How is the, those, that changing landscape over the last couple of years, changing monetary and fiscal policy, how is all that impacting how you're changing the construction of your portfolio and what individual investments you're picking? Sure. Well, I mean, I can't wait for the day, and I'm sure you as well, that, that we don't talk about the Fed. <laughs> I mean, I feel like we've been talking about monetary po policy for five years. Yep. And um, I don't think most people knew, even knew what QE or QT was five or six years ago, or, or even interest rates and the importance of how it impacts port, uh, the portfolios, PEs, valuations, styles and that sort of thing. And so that has been a big surprise in just trying to adjust the portfolio. The second thing that I think has changed, and it's just, and I don't know if it's over the last couple of years, maybe it's just over my career, how quickly stocks react mm. and how violently stocks react to news on the way up and on the way down. Um, and, and that's something that I've had to kind of get my, my, my hands around. And that is actually one of the reasons why in my portfolio, what I do try to do is I'm large cap for the most part, uh, blue chip. If I can get number one or number two companies on sale, anyone, any industry, if I can get number one or number two, and for whatever reason, it's down a whole heck of a lot. And I believe in the long-term theme. I believe in the in in the market share. As again, the management teams. If I believe in their balance sheet, free cash flow generation, margin upside, all of those things are super important. And I kind of have to tune out Fed, and I kind of have to tune out geopolitical issues. Uh, otherwise, you get wrapped up in a lot. Mm. Now, that being said. There's a big difference when the Fed is raising rates versus when they're, you know, e uh, easing rates. And so two years ago, when the Fed started to increase the interest rate outlook in the picture, and they did it so, talk about violently, they did it qu pretty quickly, mm. um, that caught a lot of growth managers off sides. And that was when I actually tilted much more towards value, because we know when re rates are going higher, long duration assets suffer. Mm -hmm. And by default, growth tech, that those are long duration assets. Um, last year was the exact opposite because people started to talk about Fed is going to ease, even though they didn't. It was that we hit the peak of rates and rates are going to come down and people kind of flocked more towards those long duration assets. I kind of think we're in this phase now where rates are going to stay higher for longer. I know that's that's kind of like consensus, which bothers me a little bit. <laughs> but I think we're going to see rates stay higher for longer, but for good reasons, Victor. Mm. Good reasons are the economy is growing much, much better than expected. Um, and it's stayed stronger for longer. So everyone's talking about rates, but really the Fed has just come around most recently, last week, that, oh, by the way, GDP is actually stronger than expected. And so then you got to have to kind of step back and say, OK, if rates are going, if they've peaked and if they've come down and they're kind of going to eventually come down, even if they stay higher for longer, but they're eventually going to come down there and the economy can, you know, can not only handle higher rates, but rates that are going to come down lower then the growth in the economy can stay pretty resilient. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good for cyclicals, for value but I don't want to abandon growth because, and we'll, we can talk about this, the total addressable markets, and I am a big fan of that, looking at total addressable markets of every various different industry. And it's not just tech, but within tech, there's so many exciting technology opportunities mm. that we can talk about, but that's why I don't want to abandon it. But do I want to have 35% of my portfolio in tech and comm services, because that's what the S&P is at right this moment. That to me is way too risky, and I don't think it makes a lot of sense. And I think everybody is on the same side of the boat in terms of growth, in terms of, I don't know, what you call MAG7 or tech in general. Most people are overweight. I am not. I am finding opportunities elsewhere. But to answer your, your original question, I will always look for, look for companies that generate huge free cash flow. And the second piece, where there's margin upside. Because if I believe the economy is going to stay strong, then top line probably stays strong. But if you get that margin inflection, where margins are kind of depressed or margins are kind of stable, but they're going to inflect higher, that's real operating leverage to the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And we know stocks follow profits on the way up and on the way down. Sure. All right. Well, let's go into some individual sectors and industry. Let's stay with the MAG7, which you just brought up. Uh, obviously, yeah. the darling of the market right now is NVIDIA. If the producers can help me throw this chart 
Um, I'd appreciate it. We'll look at NVIDIA for just a second. You know, I really enjoy listening to you on a day-to-day -day basis because you root um, your analysis in, you know, valuation. That's a part of your process, it seems. I wonder when you look at NVIDIA, I, I, you know, you don't necessarily just see price. You see valuation. Um, you know, you see revenue growth. Uh, you see operating leverage. What do you see when you look at NVIDIA? Is this thing too expensive in your in your mind, or is there still opportunity here? How do you see this? I mean, I think... I think we talk about total addressable market, and if you listen to some of the industry um, uh, reports, like a McKinsey, for example, uh, I mean, they're talking about a trillion dollar total addressable market by the end of the decade in AI, but they've got a white paper out that by 2040, it could be 15 trillion. Um, I do not know, have no idea. All I know is we're going higher because AI is everywhere. And right now, what's happening with AI is we actually are just learning to build it out. And that's why NVIDIA and Broadcom have seen such nice, and a lot of other technology companies have seen a lot of upside. We haven't even scratched the surface on companies that are not tech that are starting to use AI. Mm. And so I think it def definitely has um, a lot of legs, does it, stay just in the semiconductors and in the software companies. I'm not so, and, and, and semi-capital I'm not so sure. I actually think there, somewhere along the line at this point, moment in time, we're seeing double and triple ordering. Mm -hmm. But that's because you talk to CTOs and CIOs and they have no idea how important this is going to be for their business. And so they're just scrambling at this moment in time. Now, maybe there's real demand there and, and these double and triple orders that I believe we're starting to see will, won't come to fruition. But semiconductors are cyclical at the end of the day. And this is the, had a meteoric rise. I, I just don't, don't, it's not my style. It's, it, you know, I, I owned something like, um, I own Broadcom, I still own Broadcom, and I own Lamb Research. I think there's big AI components to both of them where they're trading much cheaper. Maybe they're not as popular. Maybe Broadcom is getting more popular, but for a long time they weren't. And while I didn't get NVIDIA, um, I was able to get other players that are going to benefit for the long term, and I think that there's better valuation and better risk reward. So I, I don't wanna say that I've never owned NVIDIA, um, I just think that it, right now uh, it is very, very popular and I've never made money, Victor, again, when everyone's on the same side of, of the boat, especially when a stock has run as much as it has. And let me just tell you this one anecdotal piece. Sure. So I have a 16 year old and she's in an economics class in high school and they have a stock picking contest going on. And this is totally like the taxi driver asking you about NVIDIA. <laughs> so 30 kids picked five stocks. 29 of them picked NVIDIA. Mm -hmm. And my daughter was the only one that didn't, unfortunately. But she picked <laughs> a lot of winners at, at elsewhere. But it just it just tells you that everybody's talking about the same things. And it's very, very exciting. But I think I wouldn't be surprised to see it take a pause. And I'd rather buy a Broadcom. I'd much rather buy a LAM Research. Mm -hmm. If you look at just an example of LAM Research, which is semi-cap equipment, not only is wafer fab equipment uh, recovering, which is a big part of their business. Uh, and we've gone through a real glut of inventory over the last couple of years, but we're now starting to get out of that glut because we did see double and triple ordering the last couple of years. Their advanced packaging business is now a billion dollar business. It's up threefold in a year. And that is all because of NVIDIA's platform. Mm. So they will benefit. And if you think about where maybe is underappreciated within AI is memory. You need six times the amount of memory to build out AI. And so to me, that is something that's very, by the way, this is a top of the line, comp, top of the line management team. Uh, the gross margins have structurally recovered and are actually on the rise. And, and that's because of a mix shift that's happening. But um, Micron last week told us that pricing is improving and that you're gonna see mid teen growth in DRAM and NAND that plays right into LAM. And by the way, it probably plays right into applied materials. I just feel like LAM is a better management team. Mm. By the way, your daughter would fit right in here at Tasty. Tasty is a big <laughs> fan of all contrarians in the world. So the one person in the class that didn't pick NVIDIA, thumbs up, round of applause to your daughter for sure. Oh, I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> if we go outside, if we go outside of AI for a little bit, yeah. 
Um, let's tiptoe around the rest of the Mag7. You've been buying up Apple lately. You've been talking about your growing position in Apple. Um, I wonder, what do you see in Apple at these particular prices or valuation that becomes attractive to you? Sure. Um, and if you want to get back to AI at one point, Victor, I will tell you I am buying something that's a little out of my comfort zone that's not on the cheaper side of things, but down 32 percent. Let's, Let's do that first. Let's do that first. That, that, that's Snowflake. Um, wow. You need now this. I'm never going to be able to defend the valuation. Yeah. It's trading at 18 yeah. times price to sales. So I'm just going to say it right now. I can't defend the, the, the valuation, okay. but I will have you know, you asked me about my portfolio and I will tell you that. If I own 30 stocks, I'm going to own maybe one or two that are outside my bench that push me a little bit maybe a little outside my comfort zone, but that I feel really good for the long term. We talked about long term. For AI to work, you need data. You need clean data. You need accurate data. You need scalable data. And Snowflake does all that. You can't run AI without data. And AI is only as good as the data that is inputted into the technology. So while the price to sales is huge, right now it's trading at 18 times price to sales, but the last five years, it's traded at 39 times price to sales. So relative to where it has traded, I think it's kind of attractive. It's down 32 percent from its high, um, from its high from when it reported earnings. Mm -hmm. And this is a company that actually had a pretty good report. I mean, they had a solid quarter percent. Bookings were up 33 percent. Gross margins were better than expected. Free cash flow was 50 million better. Um, the, they changed the CEO, and everybody loved this story because of the CEO, and the CEO is now chairman, and so they brought in somebody internally. And so there was a lot of angst. I get it. And the guidance was cautious. But that's because I think when you have a new CEO, what I like is when a new CEO comes in, they set the bar really low so they don't have to keep lowering numbers. And sure. last year, they had to lower numbers twice. And this year, I think the numbers are, ex are expected to be um, very, um, I think they're going to beat they have, they have a whole slew of new products that's not in their numbers. They've got great um, uh, OPEX control. And I would say, like, again, total addressable market, it's $248 billion total addressable market. There are going to be a lot of players that win. I actually don't even think this company is going to be around. Someone's going to buy them at some point. So I, t I have been taking advantage buying two stocks uh, in tech, as you mentioned. One is Apple. The other one is Snowflake. Um, that one I will right size. It will never be a very, really big position just because of the volatility, but I do like it for the long term. I have a small position in Snowflake as well, and you just made me sleep better at night knowing that Stephanie Link also owns this one. <laughs> uh, let's. It may take a little. It may take a little time, Victor. That's surprising, safety. by the way. I would have never thought that you'd be buying, you know, a uh, I know. you know an instrument with this type of uh, valuation. I know. It's hard for me. But I have one or two of them in my portfolio. Just one or two. Um, no problem with that. No problem with taking some risk, especially in this place. All right, let's talk Apple. 169, around yeah. the 170 handle. This is effectively, uh, you know, the lowest it's traded since May of last year. We've hit this a couple of times. Why is it? Why is now the time to start adding to your Apple position, Stephanie, in your, in your opinion? Well, and I know the chart doesn't look good, and I'm not a chartist, so I can't, I mean, I, I but I could look at that chart and say, that doesn't look pretty. So uh, is this the bottom in the, sh in the short run? I have no idea, but I, what I can tell you is the stock is down 14% from its high mm. on the concerns of, they're kind of at a, in a product lull, and they also have a DOJ overhang. I went back and I looked at the other DOJ issues. Google... Um, and the DOJ, they filed in 2020. We're not going to get a decision until likely 2026. Apple had a problem with eBooks. It took four years to resolve from the DOJ. Mm. Microsoft, we all know Microsoft, way back in 1998 and the DOJ, and it took three years to resolve. So anybody that thinks that tomorrow we're going to get a resolution is kidding themselves. I think it's a long-term situation. Most people are saying to me, the bears are saying, well, this is going to be a distraction. No way is this going to be a distraction. The company has a huge bench, a huge legal team. And I think they will certainly have to pay a fine. But I think that's about it. And this is a company that has $100 billion in free cash flow. So, OK, four, five hundred, even a billion in, in a settlement, that's fine for this company. Uh, even if it's more than that, they're generating so much free cash flow. 
And uh, I think in terms of the product cycle, well, we know they don't have AI in, in, in iPhone 15. And that's been a flop. Got it. Understood. We also know they've lowered guidance for the April quarter. So it's already been de-risked. We, we already know China is a problem for them. Why do you think that Cook, the CEO, has been over to China many times to try to resolve and get the relations to improve? Mm. It's 20% of iPhone sales. iPhone sales is 50% of the company. So it is material. But I do think they will eventually figure out how to fix the problems in China. In the meantime, services is growing double digits, and I think it will continue. And margins are at record highs. So they're able to still deliver 16% earnings growth in the face of a lull product cycle story. And I do think that we get through the April quarter, numbers are going to be ho-hum. I do think they're going to announce a new buyback program. I think it'll be 90 billion plus. And then, of course, in the summertime, everyone's talking about the whole big WWDC AI uh, conference where they're going to roll out and talk about AI. Now, why is... I mean, I think AI is interesting for this company. I do not think they're sleep, uh, asleep at the wheel. Mm. And that's pun intended because they closed the car business a couple of weeks ago because they weren't making money and they were so far behind. That's a billion dollars in CapEx that the company can actually spend in, uh, in AI. And they've got 2,000 people that were working on car that can now go to AI. So I think they're going to really do a good job in terms of proving to people they are on the ball. They made an acquisition recently. Um, I don't know if the Google thing is going to go through or not. We'll see. But the bottom line is I do think that there is upside. With the stock trading at 26 times forward, Victor, it's not cheap, but relative to its historical average that uh, of 36 times, mm -hmm. I just kind of think the risk reward is better. People now hate the stock. You know, everyone's selling it. People are downgrading it. And I may have to wait a while, but I think in a year's time, the stock's going to be higher. Can I ask you, let's take off the investor hat for a second, take off the portfolio manager hat and just speak as a citizen of the United States. I wonder when you look at Apple or you mentioned Google, Amazon, I think, has been in the crossfires as well. And you look at the DOJ's case, Sherman Act or EU and all of these companies sort of facing this monopoly, uh, these monopoly charges or potential legislation? If I could ask you a real simple question, are these monopolies in your opinion? Uh, I, I think they are monopolies, but I think they're great for the consumer. And that's the difference. The con this is good for the consumer. Um, I think there is more and more competition every day. But at the, in the end, if something is really good for the consumer and they can't prove that it's price gouging, uh, maybe in services there's some issue, mm -hmm. right, on the app side of things, for mm -hmm. sure. With but maybe 30%. they'll change that. Maybe they'll settle for that. But I just think if something is good for the consumer and the consumer wants it, it's very hard for me to tell, um, you know, these companies that they've got to break up and why that would be good. They'd have to, the DOJ would have to explain to me why that would be good for the consumer. And by the way, things can change in a heartbeat if we have a change in leadership in this country. Mm -hmm. Couldn't agree with you more. Let's go maybe outside of tech, because I think that's where sort of all the focus has been. Obviously, everybody's yeah. talking about tech concentration and all of this stuff. I wonder... Um, Let's have a little fun for a second. Tom Lee has said that he, he made a call at the Russell 2000. He sees that could rally 50%. I wonder if I could get your reaction on that as really just a transition into wider market rotation and a broadening out, in your opinion. Is that what we're seeing right now? Tom Lee is brilliant. And I hope he's right because I, I, I adore him. He's a good friend of mine. And he's, he's just absolutely brilliant. And he's always made me think. I know he's made you think, too. Um, I, I think if small cap is going to work, and by the way, sort of kind of a popular theme mm -hmm. out there, but if small cap is going to work, you need, a, you need a couple things to happen. Um, you definitely need financials to actually perk up, which we are starting to see, but you need small cap financials to right. do well. You need regionals right. to do well. You need community banks to do well. I struggle with that because I think not so much on New York Community Bank or Silicon Valley Bank. I struggle because I think the big five and six are taking share from mm -hmm. regionals and from, from the community bank. So I, I have a hard time with that, especially given where the curve is. Now, I know if we get a steeper curve, then their net interest income and margins will be better. 
But I just think I struggle with the with, with that piece of the small cap business. Um, but there is no question if we get lower interest rates, an economy that is stays solid, like two, two and a half percent, of course, that's going to be great for the small cap companies, small, small and medium sized businesses. Um, and that's 70 percent of the growth of our economy. So we, we root for that. Um, the other way I would play small caps, because it's kind of the same factor, is value in general and also some of the cyclicals. Because, again, if you think we're going to stay at two, two and a half percent growth, you think the Fed eventually lowers, that momentum is going to carry on to more companies that are exposed to the U.S. economy. And what was sort of interesting this last quarter, which I'm sure you saw, you saw as well, was in 4Q, earnings overall grew 10 percent for the S&P 500. Mm -hmm. Technology grew 9 percent. Com services grew 7 percent. But you had healthcare that grew 8 percent. You had industrials, financials and uh, industrials and financials um, at growing at 8 percent. Um, and so you had other sectors that actually did pretty well, just as well as tech. And yet those sectors have lagged. Those stocks within those sectors have lagged tremendously and they're not popular. You know, we talk about MAG7 last year. 493 last year didn't participate. We have a whole host of companies that we can play and buy and, and find real good valuation support. So I think the same theme of small caps and cyclicals kind of makes a lot of sense to me. Hmm. When you say cyclicals, where specifically do you want to be? Are you talking energy and materials, uh, industrials yep. you mentioned? And if, and if those are the areas, do you have any specific names that you'd like to call out here today? Yeah. So. So I don't know if you call this a cyclical. I kind of do. I call the consumer a cyclical um, and the consumer specifically in housing. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I think the consumer is in such better shape than people give it credit. Um, overall, uh, the companies, uh, excuse me, the, uh, these, um, the consumer is making a lot more money. They're making four to five percent in wages, initial claims. That's the, 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 the employment figure that I look at. But weekly initial claims, if you smooth it out on a four-week moving average, that's 208,000 weekly initial jobless claims. If you go back and look at other recessions, weekly initial jobless claims during a recession hits 375. We're at 208. Mm. So we have jobs. We have wages. We also have inflation that is stubborn, but down from 9% to 3 and making its way through. And I think we will maybe don't get to 2 but I think we're going to stay around 25 3%. That's very favorable. You have a 4% savings rate and you have $6 trillion in money market funds. And so to me, all of that bodes up very, very well um, for the consumer uh, at large. Um, and I would just say, I look at this company called Charles Schwab. They produce monthly numbers, cash numbers, cash balances for their clients. And last year, everybody was selling everything and just going into cash because you could get five and a half percent just overnight, but just sleep overnight. You don't have to worry about it because mm -hmm. you can get that kind of that kind of return. But what the company has been seeing since January and February, because they report these monthly figures, those numbers, the cash balances are coming down pretty substantially. And net new assets are actually going up pretty substantially, about 4.5% on an annualized basis. And that is because, and the company will tell you this, it's the fear of missing out. Everybody's in cash or in bonds because that was where everybody went last year. But they're looking at the market up 9 10% after up 26% last year, and there's FOMO happening, fear mm. of missing out. Mm. So I think the consumer is solid. I think you have fun flows going in, our, in the right direction for the consumer. And then where I really want to be exposed is, is housing. We are 5 million homes short in this country. We have four to, 14 years, if you talk to any of the home builders, 14 years of underproduction. And we have 5 million millennials that are just about to buy their first homes for the first time. That's very powerful in terms of supply and demand. And then when you add on, by the way, if you want to do this as a trade, go for it. If you want to do this as a long-term investor like me, I'm going for that. But seasonally, this is the time of the year you want to own these stocks, the home builders in particular, because their orders inflect, because it's springtime. Mm -hmm. And KB Homes reported this morning, they beat, they raised, and they saw 55% they saw order growth 
in the quarter. That's astounding to me. That's huge numbers. And everybody's telling me that, oh my gosh, housing's rolling over. Housing's not rolling over. And the other interesting thing is, yes, mortgage rates are high, but home prices are actually down for the sixth consecutive month, mm -hmm. down 7.5%. So home prices coming down, sort of kind of offsetting higher rates. But I think we've reached this point where we're short in, the, in this country and we have this dynamic of this new generation that's buying. And so I want to be there. And I think they're very cyclical. Housing is very cyclical. So if you don't want to go into the home builders themselves, I get it. But I would say that, and I happen to own DR Horton, a name that I actually re re recently bought, um, because they've got 51% of the exposure is in the South and Southeast, which is a great market, really hot. And also they have they skew more towards for first uh, first time buyers. So I like that one. But if you, if you don't want to own something so high beta, because it is, you own Home Depot. I mean, it was only up 10% last year, and the S&P 500 was up 26%. So it's lagged. It's had five straight quarters of negative comps, so you have easy comparisons going forward. Talk about profitability. In the face of negative comps, gross margins have actually been going higher. So to me, that's another way you can play it. I owned Sherwin-Williams. I made a quick 20% off the lows, and I, ca I kind of called it a day because it's not cheap. But that's another one that I that I like an awful lot. I can list a whole bunch of housing names for you, but I think that's a great theme. And in fact, you know, CNBC asks us from time to time what our favorite sectors are for the year. And, and back in October, um, I, I meant I mentioned housing, and I, I, I still think it has I, I still think it has legs. What would you need to see in order for you to change your perspective on housing? What would you need to see? Would it be the long end starting to lift for one reason or another, the tenure moving higher, which would then have immediate transmission into the economy, like, or, you know, too much supply? What, what would you need to see for you to change your thesis on home builders? I don't think we're ever going to get too much supply. I, I mean, I, so that, doesn't that sound terrible? It's like, it's like, it's almost like saying it's different this time. That's terrible. I don't want to say that. But I just think we're so undersupplied. I think it would take a long time. I think it would take a decade for us to get to supply. So, I mean, we're at about four months worth of supply. Um, equilibrium is about eight months. So we're still really tight. But I think it's a great question. Uh, I, I think that it would have to be that the 30-year that the fix gets above 8%. And we were close. We were close. Um, but I think if we are to believe the Fed, if we are to believe inflation is coming down, maybe we have seen the peak in mortgage rates. But I would say that 8% threshold is certainly going to be a barrier for sure. Mm. Uh, lots of symbols there to, to take a look at. And pr uh, production, if you can, for whatever reason, I'm not able to throw the chart, so you guys just help me follow along. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Let's go, if you don't mind, Stephanie. The, the, the pet rock is not that interesting, so I don't think you guys talk about you know gold and stuff like that on CNBC too much. If you don't mind, indulge me, okay? Because I'm old school, I'm a little bit boring, and I need to get out of the house. But I wonder what you make of the gold rally in, in the face of higher real yields. And, and if I could ask a two-part question, because I'm not a trained journalist, the second part of the question would be, you know, uh, Stanley Druckenmiller has been loading up, or I would say building a position on gold miners. And these things have been the most unloved stocks uh, you could make a case in the marketplace. So Newmont Mining and Barrick Gold being two of those things. What do you think about the pet rock? Uh, being strong in the face of higher real yields, and then what do you think about gold miners? Is that is that a thing that Stephanie Link looks at at all in terms of looking for exposure? I I watch gold very importantly. I've never made money in gold. Um, I've owned it in the past, um, the GDX. I've owned um, a couple of names, pure play gold names, but n never really never really made money because I felt like the companies themselves. Um, they were more trading vehicles, and there are always, to me, the one, at least maybe I picked the wrong ones, but they were, they were always companies that had huge expenses, huge cost structures, um, lack of discipline, um, and very tied to the gold price in general. And I never felt like the companies realized as much as I expected them to in terms of where the gold price was and how that translated into earnings growth. Um, they're cheap. I feel like they've been cheap for a long time. If, if, I, if I can tell you and talk my book, I actually do own Freeport MacMoran, mm. but gold is, that's for copper, not mm -hmm. necessarily gold, but it, sometimes it gets lumped in because it does have a small exposure to gold. Um, what I worry more about is why gold is going up because I ask everybody and no one really knows. Um, and we know that 
it might not be a great sign that gold is is going higher. Um, and is there something that gold is sniffing out, mm -hmm. almost like the yield curve? The yield curve has been negative for a very long time, and yet it, it, it hasn't signaled recession. But is it just on a delayed time basis because the Fed is kind of intervening in the in the in the bond market? If those two things I watch very very closely, um, and I think it is something that. It's, it's got to be something that I'm missing, and it must be. In one of my 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 thought process is it's saying that inflation stays higher for longer, mm. and then rates stay higher for longer, well, um, you... and that probably would not be good for the overall economy. But for now, I don't think it's. it's I mean, I look at these charts. It's not huge. I mean, it's had a nice run, but it's not hugely uh, breaking out. But it's certainly something that I keep my eye on, and I and I scratch my head on it. I don't know. Do you have a thesis on it? Um. Some part of me does. I know China, China's central bank was a really big buyer of gold over you know, the most recent history. Some part of me believes that we're headed towards a period where uh, there are increased risks. Like the distribution of risk to me are balanced, but there are lots of places we can go on both the left and the right tail. And I think in, if you go back to the 60s and 70s, gold was a high performing asset during a period of high inflation, a sort of a populist um, a populist political environment. So, you know, I think all of those things play are at play here. Um, but, you know, my guess is as good as any. You did mention another base metal there, copper. Uh, Freeport McMoran has been on a tear. Copper's been elevated. And it seems the narrative here has always been sort of a boring China growth demand story. And there's a new story with electrification. I wonder if you could speak to that. Yeah, I mean, I think that is a big part of the story. And I think it actually also ties into another theme that I like very much, which is improving the grid mm. uh, and improving the infrastructure in this economy. And if I, if I can be honest with you here, housing, the number one commodity that goes into housing is copper. So I, I kind of think that my, I'm sort of at least, if, not, if I'm nothing else, I'm consistent. <laughs> so if I believe in housing, that's great. Copper, copper should work. If I believe in global growth improving, which I do, I think copper works. If we, if we think that China is going to continue to stimulate, maybe not this max boom stim stimulation, but they're going to continue to be easier. That should lead to a little bit better growth. That should help copper too. The supply demand situation is very tight in terms of copper, really hard to get. Not many companies can do it and do it well and efficiently. Mm. And so for me, those are the themes that I like um, very much. And by the way, back to the grid, I mean, we just passed last year two and a half trillion dollars worth of infrastructure spending. Uh, we're going to spend $10 billion alone just on grid improvements in 44 states. I think we're going to need a hell of a lot more than 10 billion, but at least it's a start. And so when you get the grid fixed, that's going to help the infrastructure part of EV and that theme, and and uh, and 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 copper certainly should benefit. So, Freeport's number one producer in the industry. For every ten cents per pound change in copper, that's four hundred and thirty million dollars in EBITDA and three hundred and forty million in cash flow. This company, uh, back in twenty twenty, had six billion in net debt. Today, 800 million. So they've been generating, goes back to my free cash flow, why it's so important. They have been generating so much cash flow because copper has been elevated um, and they've been very disciplined. So they're lowering their debt. So their balance sheet gets better. And free cash flow is going to go from $505 million back in 2020 to $2 billion by the end of this year. That gives companies all kinds of flexibility. Mm. And so you have a tight market. You've got a lot of ways to win in, ter in terms of the end markets and how they play. And the stock really isn't all that expensive at 9.5 times EBITDA. The average, by the way, is 22 times EV to EBITDA. So I think this company has totally changed the way uh, they do business, the way they operate, and for the better. And uh, it's not just a China play. To your point, it's not just a China play anymore. Mm. All right, we've only got a couple more minutes with you, and this has been incredible. I would say this, I feel like I've said this a few times, only a handful, but I was really looking forward to this, and this is, has not disappointed. I'm going to give you, yeah. do you mind if I put you in the hot seat? I'm going to ask you a couple questions, rapid fire style, and that's how we're going to take this bad boy out. You okay with that? I'm good. All right, here we go. Stephanie Link is in the hot seat. Uh, when there's blood in the streets, that's when you look for opportunities. Is there enough blood in the streets, in your opinion, Stephanie, to start adding Boeing to the portfolio? 
No question. Very easy. No question. Uh, I think this story only gets better from here, and it's hated. And you get one good operator in there. My vote is Dave Cody. Just throwing it out there. Mm. I wonder, he was from Honeywell back in the day. They do have earnings at the end of the quarter, and you made a point earlier that when you have when, when you have a CEO switch, it's an opportunity to flush expectations down the toilet. And one has to wonder if they take this opportunity and this transition between now and the end of the year when Calhoun is out to sort of do that same thing and flush future expectations down the toilet. But I'm with you. I've been building a position um, over the last couple of weeks. Larry Fink's annual letter came out. He's been making the rounds talking about a retirement crisis. My question to you, Stephanie, do you think we need to raise the retirement age in America? I think a lot of people don't want to retire at 65 anymore. That's my thinking, because we're living old. We're living. We're live. We're we're living older and longer. Um, do we need to? Probably, probably, because we're not where we were when they actually had the retirement age and when they, when they set it. My quest. My my worry is we don't have enough people that are saving enough mm. for sixty five years old retirement. Mm. All right, we are adding a trillion dollars onto our national debt every one hundred days. I wonder, is that something that keeps Stephanie Link up at night? How do you feel about that? So I worry about my 16 year old. I think we're going to kick the can down the road for a very long time. We could barely get a continuing resolution passed. And so I think that our, not you nor I are going to have to deal with this, but it's our 16 year olds, our 15 year olds, it's that generation, unfortunately, that's going to have to deal with it. But a lot can happen. A lot can happen. Look, at the end of the day, if rates go lower, that'll help, number one. But number two, very importantly, remember, Biden is a spender, but so is Trump. Both are spenders. They just spend differently. So it's not going away. Mm. I wonder, most people have the luxury of making their investment decisions in private. If it goes well, nobody knows. If it goes, if it doesn't go so well, nobody knows. You do not have that luxury. Every day you have to give your investment opinion in real time. I wonder, what, does, what can you offer in terms of the lessons that you've learned about using your voice offering fearless opinions and dealing with constant opposition, whether that's online or other people that you're debating in these media formats. What do you offer to the people about fearlessly using their voice and dealing with opposition? I think that it's very important to stay humble. I've been doing this 33 years. You've been doing this for just as long. And you're going to get winner, you're gonna have winners and losers. You're going to have good years. You're going to have bad years. Really good stocks, really bad stocks. If you have a 500 batting average, you're a hero. That's my goal. Um, but I just think if you, you're you going to make mistakes, the best thing you can do for yourself is learn from your mistakes. The worst thing you can do is keep repeating your mistakes. Mm. So try to learn from your mistakes because that's how you become a better investor. Mm. Last question for you. Um, becoming a market participant was one of the greatest things I think I could have done for my own decision making, for learning from failure, from being, from being accepting of failure, um, and, and figuring out how to turn decisions that don't work out the way that I had hoped, turning that into something positive, into growth. I wonder, for you, what has the idea of embracing risk and market participation, what has it brought you in your life? Oh, wow. I mean, that's uh, we can talk for hours on that. I, I actually think that um, as I get older, I am more appreciative of kind of having that diversification and having that balance. Um, when you're young, you have a long time horizon, so you can take on more risk. You can take on more equity exposure versus fixed income exposure. I think you just want to participate. Um, I think you never go wrong with um, just blue chip companies that aren't as sexy or glamorous as kind of Reddit or the meme stocks. You can have a couple of those names in your portfolio. Have fun with it. That's what I'm doing with Snowflake, for example, right? But don't make it all your entire portfolio. Remember this one stat. Over the last 50 years, the average return of the S&P 500 was 7.7%. The average return. In bonds, it's 3%. So you might have an amazing year last year, up 26%, growth was up 40%, but that's not normal. Because by the way, the year before, it was the exact reverse. We were down 18% and growth was down 38%. So be balanced, have some fun with it, learn from your mistakes. But I've never gone wrong owning blue chip companies that are on sale. 
When they throw baby out with the bathwater and you have a big, big decline in the market and they're selling things like Starbucks, McDonald's, IBM, Microsoft, you want to own some of those companies on the declines. And so think about buying low and selling high. People say they do it, Victor. They do not. People buy, buy high and sell low. It's really, really hard to buy low and sell high. Last two questions. I'll make them really fast. How many cuts do we get this year, Stephanie? Zero, one, two, three, or something else? Two. Two cuts. Who do you got winning your NCAA bracket? Last question. I got Houston, but I think I think UConn looks really, really great. You know, I'll just tell you a little bit of a secret. When I graduated college, I actually wanted, you're old enough to understand this, I wanted to be Chris McKendry on ESPN. Yeah. She was one of the hosts on ESPN. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be in finance, and I didn't, I didn't, I wanted to be on TV, but somehow I took this detour, and I'm in finance on TV. But mm -hmm. I did want to be her. She's a, she's absolutely a rock star, so I'm a big sports fan, and I don't know, my fingers are crossed for Houston. You and I both. I picked a profession in fifth grade at the back of my mathematics class. They basically had professions on one side, the level of math you needed on the other. DJ had nothing in the math spot, and that's the one I wanted. Somehow, I think I'm a DJ that needs the most math experience. I don't know how that ended up. Stephanie, I really appreciate your time. We hope, we hope you'll come back on many more times. It's a pleasure not only to watch you on CNBC, but I really enjoy your blogs. If people want to follow you on Twitter, they want to read your blogs you guys have over at Hightower, I wonder if you could tell them where they can go. Sure. Well, on Twitter, it's Stephanie underscore link. And uh, I'm on Twitter a lot. I try to I try not to pay attention to the negativity, try to stay positive. But um, it's, it's a lot of fun, the banter back and forth. So Great thank advice. you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for being here, Stephanie. Uh, for everybody out there, we will see you back here tomorrow. We want to thank our very special guest, Stephanie Link, for stopping by and telling us what she thinks is cheap and what she thinks is not cheap. We're going to be back here tomorrow, same time, same place, with a very special guest, Ryan Grace um, from uh, our very own Tasty Crypto is going to be uh, joining us and walking us through uh, this wild world of cryptocurrency. So join us here tomorrow, same time, same place, only on Tasty Life. Peace.